I'm going to be making two videotapes. The first one, uh, it, the, the, the each ideally is no more than half an hour. The first one is, was a very interesting circumstance, which I think many of us, particularly those of us who are in the academic business, uh, have to make. And that is, let me describe a circumstance. Um, I am familiar with a large number of universities. I've been in a lot of them. And there's a university at which I've lectured 18 times and given six workshops. It's a very famous university. I know every dean since 1972. I have former students on the faculty. It's a university that was founded in the German system. The German system is that the faculty votes for the chairman and the senior faculty vote for the dean. And it's a highly politicized, highly departmentalized, highly compartmentalized university. Very typical, there's nothing strange about it. And the, the faculty of architecture and town planning invited three people, uh, in, including me, to come and review the landscape architecture program. The other two colleagues, uh, who will remain anonymous, as will the school, um, are very distinguished academics, serious, serious people with a lot of leadership experience. But they had never been to this school. And I knew that the problems of this department were caused by the problems of the school, caused by the problems of the university and that they can't solve their problems by themselves. So there was a very different good guy, bad guy relationship between the three of us as visitors. I was specifically asked for advice. Why? Because the dean, a new dean, totally understood the problems that he was facing. And the issue was that the students were not the problem, the senior faculty was the problem. And the traditions of the school were the problems. Now, the sociology was four days of full-time meeting, including lunch and dinner, with all kinds of people, students, faculty, other departments. It was a very serious thing. At the very beginning of it, every one of the three visitors was asked to give a talk, a public talk. And I gave a talk called Trends and Influences and Their Implications on Practice in Education and Design. It's a talk, I'll summarize it, later in the conference in some session. I'm not going to talk. That audience was about 60 people, uh, mainly faculty, and from across the school. The dean, the associate dean, and the chairman of the landscape department had read my book. And we've met six, four months ago privately, and we talked about it. I'm going to show you a presentation that I had to give to the senior faculty of the school and the junior faculty, the faculty of the school, at the end of the last day at which the three visitors were asked, what should they do? And in doing that, I'm going to show a set of graphics, because this is a very visual audience, and I'm perfectly prepared to share those graphics with anybody who wants them. So I thought I would get it on videotape, and those of you who find it useful or interesting, I'm more than happy to share the graphics. So what I'm going to do now is make a presentation as though I'm talking to the senior faculty of a very distinguished school. By the way, it's a school that has uh, architecture as its foundation, landscape architecture, um, urban and regional planning, and industrial design as four departments. Thank you for coming and allowing me to summarize the last four days of our discussions with the school. I think uh, you all know from my first lecture that I'm interested in a particular set of problems which cut across the capabilities of the distinguished departments at this university and which, in my opinion, no one of them can resolve. It's clear 
that for serious societal and environmental issues, designing for change cannot be a solitary activity. Rather, it's inevitably a collaborative endeavor with participations, participants from various design professions and geographic sciences, linked by technology from several locations for rapid communication and feedback, and reliant on transparent communication with the people of the place who are also direct participants. Geodesign is an invented word and a very useful term to describe a collaborative activity that is not the exclusive territory of any design profession, geographic science, or information technology. Each participant must know and be able to contribute something that the others cannot or do not. Yet during the process, and I emphasize, no one need lose his or her professional, scientific, or personal identity. These problems, which cut across size, scale, and theme, share six questions. How should the context be described? How does the context function? Is the context working well? How might the context be altered? What differences might the proposed changes cause? And what should be done? How should the context be changed? They're organized, in my mind, and in a book that, as you know, I've recently written, into a framework, a framework for geodesign. The first question is answered by representation models. These are data, and they could be any kind of data. The second question, how does the context operate? These are process models, and they represent the knowledge that we have about how our environment works. The third question, is the current context working well? These are evaluation models, and they depend on the values of the people of the place. And those vary by culture, geography, time, attitude, social class, and all kinds of reasons. And political consensus is one of the objectives. The fourth question, how might the context be changed? These are change models. These are ways of proposing what the future might be like, and with the purpose of improving the present conditions. But they are data. They are descriptions of a new environment. The fifth question, what differences might the changes cause? These are impact models. And they are knowledge, forecast knowledge, of how these environments that we have are going to change in the future if we make a particular set of changes. And finally, how should the context be changed? These are decision models. These are the ways that governments, corporations, individuals make decisions and they depend on the values of those people and institutions. The process typically would begin with a group of people saying, we've got a problem, let's try to make things better. And they ask a group of other people, in orange, design professionals, in green, information technologists, and blue, scientists, to help them with that problem, to help them with that problem, not to decide what to do, but to help them decide what to do. The first phase is trying to understand what's going on. These are the why questions. Why are we here? What are we doing? And what you're really trying to do is understand the values, knowledge, and data of the place. How do the people think? How do they make decisions? What's important to them? What do they know? What don't they know? What do they fear? The second phase is the how. How is the group assembled to attack this set of problems going to work together. How are we going to communicate? And what's important here is to realize that the decision models, the values of the decision process drive the system, not the data. In order to make a decision, you need to compare opportunities and alternatives. In order to compare them, you have to have them. In order to have them, you have to evaluate the current situation in the same language that you're going to decide. In order to compare them, you're going to have to have process models that allow you to compare them. And finally, you're going to have to have data. The third stage is the what, where, and when. What, where, and when are we going to do? And it really follows through two processes. The use of data, knowledge, and values in assessment, and the use of data, knowledge, and values in intervention. 
And it's the intervention that we're here for. And something will go wrong. And we have to be able to feed back into any of these levels of work. Any of these models can be the subject of feedback. And you may have to change scale. And if you change scale, the exact same questions occur. But the answers, the models, change. And eventually, you say to yourself, yes, I think we've done what we can do. Let's pass this back to the decision process. And there, we rely on the values of these people to decide. And we hope they decide yes. This is never a linear process. Something will go wrong. Now, scale and size matter. We classify our problems and describe them in different ways. And we have different numbers, lots of local problems, fewer regional ones, and one set of big global problems. And we classify and use different words and ideas as a function of size and scale. Every design, regardless of size and scale, involves expression, organization, and allocation. Allocation means how much do we have and where does it go. Organization means how do the pieces fit together and work together. And expression is how does it feel, how does it look, how does it smell. At this size and scale, we have high public understanding and many decentralized decisions. And those drop off. At this scale and size, we have great scientific complexity and highly centralized decisions. Typically, the design professions are taught this way. And they don't get all that far. And design professions, I would say, the schools, this school's activities, architecture, landscape architecture, urban and regional planning, industrial design, I would add civil engineering, and other places in the university that have the same set of issues. At this scale, geology, ecology, sociology, economics, they start with generalism, general theories that they believe to apply anywhere, but they never get this far. The design professions really focus on expression and organization. And they typically follow demand. The client has a problem, let's solve the problem. Let's change. Whereas the sciences generally are supply-based. Let's protect what we have that's good. And they generally start with defensive strategies, sustainable, conservation, etc. And they tend to deal with allocation and organization much more. So this is where I think we are. I think this is where we are as a university, and this is where we are as a culture. We do quite well here, and have for thousands of years. We do okay here in terms of the science, but very badly on the public policy. And we're weakest in the middle, which is where I think collaboration in geodesign can be most significant. The scale of watersheds, counties, municipalities, small countries. I believe very strongly in these two quotes. Herbert Simon, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And Galileo, many devices, methods, processes, etc., which succeed on a small scale do not work on a large scale. This is where I think architecture is. Start with a building, I'm sorry. Get bigger, get bigger, but not up here. Mainly offensive strategies, demand-based, a little bit of work with other professions, some work with people, some with information, technologies, heavily involved with expression and organization. But basically accepting the idea that the client is right to be where he's proposing or she's proposing to build, which is usually not true. This is where I think landscape architecture is. Similar to architecture, but carrying its work a little bit larger, but only on part of the systems being changed. And let me toggle and look here. Look at this building. This is the landscape architect's view of the same place. That's the architect's view of the same place. 
This is where I think urban and regional planning are. Somewhere in organization, very little in expression. We're working at these scales. And this is where I think most geographically oriented sciences are. And this is where I think a design profession school should be. Because each of these groups that we have in the school is getting around the problem, but not into the problem. And what they do is amateurish, because they're not collaborating. And that's what I think a great university should be. Because even the school of design, of architecture and planning, does not have all the things that influence it and it influences. And that's a university issue, not a school issue. Most design professionals are taught on the premise that the student knows everything. And most people practice as a small practice. As the projects get bigger, you may have a corporate client or a community client, but the ideal practice is still me with my staff working in a project that I supervise by knowing everything. And it falls apart as an ideal. It falls apart at this scale. When the diversity of things and the complexity of public participation require a fully different model of what the aim of education is. It's managing a process of the work of many other people rather than presuming that you know the work of everybody. And as you get to this scale, there's a change. Here, the designer may well be the engineer, the civil engineer, the landscape architect, the architect, any one of them might be in charge. But as you get even larger, that's no longer true. The scientist is likely, or the lawyer is likely to be in charge. You are still part of the team, but you become a minor part of the team. And at the global scale, it really works like this, with each country having its own team of the same people competing for the position of what the global strategy should be. Now, what do you do about this? Well, the first thing you have to recognize is that there are different levels of education. There's a difference between professional entry, where you're given a problem and you're given a method, post-professional, where you select a problem and you select a method, and research professional, where you seek a problem and you create a method. And that pervades, that pervades every aspect of the complexity with which, and the sophistication with which you undertake a study. And those are not the same. It doesn't automatically flow from one to the other. There's a real difference between training an architect or a civil engineer here and training one and educating them to work in the process like this. And these projects at this level, and the studies at this level, will never be done by that person, except as an academic exercise, or as a provocation. In my opinion, everybody, every undergraduate, should have an experience of the scientist, the information technology, the people of the place, and the offensive strategies of the design professions in collaboration on one of these problems. They have to think big before they think small. They have to think practical before they think global, in my opinion. Most of them will go back. Most of them will go back into the design professions at this scale and the science at the laboratory level and in the applied sciences at this scale for one simple reason. There are many more jobs at those levels. And they're necessary, respected jobs. But some will come back. And the ones that come back will potentially be the leaders at this level where I believe most of the important practical decisions to improve the world will take place. So how do you do that? How do you move from where we are now to producing the people who can be the captain or the conductor of that team and an effective partner and participant? This is the school structure today. There's a Department of Urban and Regional Planning, which offers a Bachelor of Science degree, and a Master's degree, and a PhD. There's a Landscape Architecture Department, which has a BLA, 
which is legally recognized by the country for registration. It does not have a PhD program. There's not a research program there. There's a master's program that's beginning to do research. The architecture department gives a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD. And the industrial design department only gives a master's degree. Right now, the program is in conformity with the Bologna process, which for the schools outside the United States and some other countries is essential by law for the structuring of education. The first step in my recommendation to you is you put together a landscape architecture PhD program from, by drawing on people from the university who are interested in landscape at a territorial scale. The second thing that you should do is an overlay over these departments in collaboration through geodesign. What that implies is the following, and it's a very important uh, aspect of this. And that's to recognize that there are two kinds of advanced students. After they have a bachelor's degree, and at the master's level, having had at the bachelor's degree some cross-school collaboration, they will typically make a decision between going deeper into their professions in an infinite number of ways. Or saying, wait a minute, what I'm really interested in is how we work together across professions. The system has to be begun at the PhD level. Because if you have some PhD students who are interested in this collaborative aspect, they will produce the methods and the staff to help teach the undergraduates in collaboration and to lead that process. And after a few years, you'll build up a capability in geodesign and no one at this point knows where that's going to go, whether it will become something special or a service to the rest of the school and university. But I recommend highly that you do this as a means of drawing in people from other faculty than the college, because this group will provide ideas and services and models for the rest of the university. You have to develop a shared communication basis, which means a shared knowledge of the subject, shared assumptions, and a shared language. This is not easy, but it's one of the major aspects of education that will enable people to talk to each other across professions and with the people of the place. It's essential for leadership. You need a framework, whether it's the one that I've written about or any of the other half-dozen frameworks which are in the literature. But this is not an unorganized, casual collaboration. It's a highly organized, highly managed collaboration. Why? Because you want your students to have the skills of organization and management and they'll never have them unless they're taught them and experience them. You need a highly organized technical support system that is in place. It needs to be thought through, it needs to be funded, it needs to be implemented. It needs to be flexible because technologies change very rapidly. But it's no longer possible for a faculty member to say, I'm going to teach a course and begin from the beginning with data, technology, means and methods. That has to be in place and a corporate decision. It's not a democracy for the faculty. It's a corporate decision by the faculty. You need to understand that there are many ways of designing, many ways of proposing change, and different fields have different methods. And the problem that you'll have in these problems that cut across size and scale is working at several scales simultaneously possibly with different methods of making change. You're going to need to identify the faculty by sizes and scales of their experiences and roles and identify missing pieces. This is an idea that I got from Tam Paradis, who got it from the cover of my book. Like, who are the faculty? What scales are they comfortable about? And are they here, 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 or in combinations in the middle? And where are the missing pieces? because these four groups are necessary for the collaboration on these kinds of problems, especially in the middle. You're going to identify your courses by model types and roles, and you're going to identify course and information technology tutorial needs. I believe you need four assets, four assets, to produce this cross-cutting activity for the school. One of them is 
history and case studies. The students need to have history and case studies of complicated societal environmental problems and how they were resolved, if they failed, why they failed, if they succeeded, why they succeeded. Not the product, but the how they were done. I believe that courses in the whole school could be organized on the basis of models and who teaches them, and that that would be more profitable than the current content-oriented structure of most curricula. You're going to need a substantial number of information technology tutorials to support those courses. But those tutorials are, on the one hand, abstract methods that can be applied to anything, but they are also models which can be used for the studies that are being undertaken at that time. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, you're going to have to have new kinds of studios, not based on the idea of one student, one project, but based on the idea of 15 students, one project. And they ideally are led by students, led by students, supported by faculty, rather than led by faculty. The student should not be given a client, a problem, st statement, and a site. The student should have to figure out who the clients are, what the problems are, and what the sites are, and recognize that they're in conflict, and have to figure out the complications of that. And finally, you're going to need a thesis structure that's supported by multidisciplinary teams, not disciplinary teams. A curriculum, well, every undergraduate should take a history and case studies course, a general, a, a general course related to the stages of a project, and have at least one studio experience. I believe that very strongly. It should be part of the first year or second year of an undergraduate education. The same would be the first year of a master's program. And I believe that it should be called Master of, the field that you came with in geodesign, not Master in Geodesign. In other words, for the school that you have, you have very strong, very long established programs in the professions. And these are second professional degrees with the notice to the people who have that degree that they've worked across in other professions, as opposed to going higher in their professions. The second semester, and it's a one-year program as far as I can see for this school, is to take a student-run studio on a very major project and at least two of the three kinds of courses that are needed in greater depth, because you probably have one of them in your background. If you need all three, it'll take you longer. And a PhD student supported by those courses would be doing a thesis. The focus of these problems would typically be up here. This is where I think the school should be and can be with a relative short amount of time. And this is where I think the school as a structure would be like. And that's my advice.